Welcome to Processing Out Loud here on Twitter Spaces. I'm your host, Madeline Literal Coyle, and today we will be diving in a little deeper into some of the topics we discussed this week with the developer community at Intel Innovation. Let's keep the party going. Joining me today is Arun Gupta, Vice President and General Manager of Open Ecosystems here at Intel along with Bill Pearson, Vice President of the Network and Edge Group and General Manager of Developer Software at Intel, and Jen M. Huffstetler, Chief Product Sustainability Officer, Vice President and GM of Future Platform Strategy and Sustainability at Intel. If you have any questions for our panel today, please feel free to tweet them out and tag us at hashtag Intel on, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. All right, let's just start with a quick and easy opening question for the whole group. It's been a really busy week here at Intel Innovation, really exciting, lots of announcements. Of everything we discussed this week for developers, what excited you most? And let's go ladies first with Jen. Thanks for asking. I think I was most excited to hear about uh, the actual end user experience with Project Amber, which we announced back uh, in May and its ability to provide independent attestation service that makes it possible to scale and move workloads across the wider range of edge on-prem and cloud environments. I think it really highlights the future of the multi-cloud edge world that we'll be living in and the technologies that we need for that. Absolutely, and that was a recurring theme, especially in, in day one. What about you, Bill? What were you most excited about? What was the highlight? Uh, for me, the was Pat uh, announcing the Intel Getty platform, and you know this is a really cool platform that allows anyone in enterprise teams to just rapidly develop AI models and create solutions for their particular business challenges. So if you're a domain expert, a data scientist, you can take this intuitive interface to add your own like image, video data, make annotations, train, retrain, export, optimize AI models for for deployment. And what's cool about the platform is it makes it so easy for the developer to do this. 20 to 30 images to get started. You can start your training with that and build a, a model. And it just enables all of this rapid model development by taking out some of the complexities that developers would normally face. And of course, you can take and deploy that model with OpenVINO. So to me, it was just a, a great setup there. And I, I actually have a blog about it. You can look at my, my uh, tweets from earlier this week to, to go find it. Awesome. Thanks, Bill. We'll have to go look that up. And Arun, what about you? Other than being on yeah. Innovation Live, of course, with me and Rob. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, um, I've been a developer all my life. So I think the most exciting thing for me particularly was Intel Developer Cloud. This is a service platform for developing and running workloads in Intel optimized environments using the latest Intel processors and performance optimized software stacks. So this hardware, the hardware that we release is available in a pre-early access environment to developers. They can test it, optimize it, and by the time it gets to production, they're actually ready to just seamlessly transition over. So that to me is quite exciting. And uh, I think we are on a really something big over here. And it also ties back to the developer first initiative that Pat talks about it all the time. So I think it really connects with me personally one-on-one. -on -one. Well, let's stick with you for a minute, Erin, if you don't mind, on open ecosystems. Why are open ecosystems so important to this development process? They're super important, actually. You know, I mean, what do you think? What, what do we think open means? Well, open really means no vendor lock-in. Open means no walled gardens. Open means collaboration. Open means faster development cycle because you are really tapping into the collective knowledge of a globally diverse and vibrant community. The question I have in this modern era is, why would you do any other way but open? And open gives you a choice a choice of solutions across multiple vendors and ensures portability across an expanded section of the latest tools and technologies. A choice to pick a solution that maximizes your developer value for your company. And that in turn improves your confidence in the solution. And this is also indicated by Linus's law, which says given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. This helps being, you know, improving your security posture of your application. So really, Open is the only way everybody should think about it because vendor neutral standards, they create a more trustworthy, secure, sustainable, and future-proof solutions. And on top of all of those things, how does this open standards-based environment accelerate innovation? Yeah, let's take examples. You know, um, let's take an example of uh, Linux, for example. Uh, Linus, you know, Torvalds invented Linux 
because he wanted to learn the 80386 architecture as a book written by our CEO Pat Gelsinger and in his email announcing his work you know this is about 30 years ago he said just a hobby won't be a big won't be big and professional we all know what happened after that like how ideas upon ideas upon ideas were created there and iterated upon and linux and i mean if you probably checked your email if you sent a message if you streamed a movie you're probably using linux at the back end open jdk another example is a open source reference implementation for java imagine if only one company was the one that was contributing to it the pace would be quite different but being open source you know it really accelerates because what we are doing is everybody is contributing one particular feature that matters to them and collectively it improves the value of the overall open source project i mean intel has been a long time contributor to open jdk cryptography hashing checksum acceleration are the kind of features that we usually contribute that really help optimize your microservices in the cloud ditto for kubernetes we are among the top 10 contributors among the 4000 plus companies that contributes to it so long story short every patch every pull request every bug fix serves your very specific need but also the software incrementally gets better maybe just a tiny bit but all of these core changes together is what improves developer velocity developer productivity and it's one step at a time right even even the smallest tiniest step is progress exactly another question for you how is intel's one api making the development process easier sure when you program for a gpu you typically must run some special programming model that only runs on that gpu this means that you must then debug on the gpu which can be challenging uh you need separate debuggers harder to analyze memory etc with one api your program will run on the gpu but also on the cpu that means you can debug on your cpu just like you always do the problem becomes much more complex if there are multiple accelerators such as fpga or any other uh, hardware devices also gpu hardware vendors typically have their own languages for example nvidia has cuda amd has hip you know these are wall gardens and lock you into their hardware as we discussed earlier this is not a good choice for developers this mm-hmm. does not allow customers to choose the right platform for them if you use one api the code is written in c++ with sickle as a template library the code is then compiled cross compiled to target nvidia or amd or intel gpus we don't lock you in in addition to cpus now write once debug deploy anywhere is the premise and sickle really comes from the chronos group which is the same standards body that created open gl which was the original standard for uh, 3d graphics so in that sense you know really is the solution to drive accelerated compute for developers um, and provide a standard way of um, programming and one final question for you you've been a champion of open source for some time now i mean you tell some of the most iconic brands transition to open source that's apple and amazon and sun microsystems and and now intel what are some of the innovations that developers here at intel have created or contributed to open source that maybe you're the most proud of to my biggest amazement you know coming to intel has been like wow there is so much open source work happens here mm-hmm. and so really my job is just being a storyteller intel has always had a rich history in driving open platforms and industry shaping standards usb wifi bluetooth and many more and all the apis that enable them we created cyclomatic which really helps developers more easily port your proprietary wall garden cuda code to cycle and c++ and accelerate cross architecture programming for heterogeneous architectures we released four ai kits a couple of months ago and three more last week and now we have a plan for 30 kits by the release of may 2023 one dnn is a deep neural network library that is now the default in tensorflow we are also the lead for windows release of task force a uh, tensorflow now these are some innovations happening on the projects that are created by intel but we also contribute heavily to the community built oss software so intel was the founding member of linux foundation cloud native computing foundation open source security foundation and 700 plus open source foundation and standard bodies we wow. realize the importance that these bodies bring in terms of 
being vendor neutral, um, neutral copyright trademarks and open governance. Um, Kubernetes, again, standard compute platform, top 10 contributor. Uh, we have been the top corporate contributor for Linux kernel for 15 years. So I think that was the biggest amazement to me. There is so much exciting work happening at Intel around open source. We just got to do a better job of storytelling. <laughs> right. Well, you used a great metaphor when we chatted earlier this week. And I have to admit, I shared it with Pat and he said he's going to steal it for his next keynote. So sorry, maybe he'll attribute it to you. But you said, really, Intel is the water and developers are fish. Exactly. And that's how I see it. You know, I mean, if you think about all of these technologies that I'm talking about, developers are using them left and right every day without realizing all of our contributions goes upstream and they're available in all major downstream distros. What that means is not only does developers are the fish and we are the water because we are everywhere, they just don't know it, but we are constantly adding calcium phosphate you know, to the water just to make sure the fish stay healthy. So we are constantly mm -hmm. adding new stuff to the platform so that by the time our new hardware comes up, developers don't have to do extra stuff like, oh, where do I pull this patch in? How do I get this working? It's just there. So in that sense, we are always there Developers just need to acknowledge it a bit more. I love that. I love that quote. I love that metaphor. And I'll definitely be using it from now on. Thank you, Arun. If you have more questions for Arun, please feel free to submit them. Use the hashtag Intel on and we'll try to circle back at the end with, with our few minutes left. Bill, I'd like to turn our attention over to you for education and inspiration. You recently used a quote that, that I love, that developers have the ability to create magic. Tell us what you mean by that. Yeah, I mean, really, developers are just capable of building so many incredible things. They, they provide that magic, that spark that helps solve those challenging problems, build those interesting solutions. They take their all of their intuition, their creativity, their innovation, and their creation, and they result in something that is literally magic. It's these great solutions that, that change the world around us. And for me, you know, it's my privilege, along with the team of engineers, business folks, to be able to really create tools that help enable, enable developers to continue creating that magic. That's awesome. I mean, we saw a lot of magic on stage this week. <laughs> yes. That is for sure. I think we used that word magic multiple times this week. So your mission is to educate and inspire developers. What are some of the ways that Intel is helping developers get better at what they do? Yeah, there's many ways, you know, developer communities, um, of course, play a strong role in this learning is one. So when you think about training developers, writing training courses, certifications that that are available, um, but we also uh, look to make things as easy as possible for developers. Uh, one example of this, you know, we saw this week um, yeah, with AI and our, our mission just to take this complex technology and make it more accessible. So we look at how do we make it simpler for the developer? How do we automate some of the development pipeline? Just ultimately build a world-class developer experience for them. And oftentimes this results in tools, again, the Intel Getty platform launch being, being one of those. We also focus on helping solve some of the key industry challenges that developers are, are facing. So through our Intel developer catalog, we have reference implementations. These are things like defect detection or intelligent traffic management. They're open source, they're full solutions. We show developers how we've solved the problem. They can use it as a reference. They can take it to production if they'd like, but this helps them get a head start on you know, solving common challenges and problems. We also launched tools like Intel Developer Cloud for the Edge. So when you look at the idea of, okay, how do I take this model that I've, I've developed with the Intel Getty platform, how do I take that to deployment? Um, we've enabled developers to very easily take that workload and they can also add their own containers, Helm charts, et cetera, to that. Run this on the developer cloud for the edge, be able to go quickly determine the right hardware configuration for them, understand the performance KPIs that they want to reach, and then determine what it's going to take to ultimately deploy that across, across hardware. So we're helping them consistently solve problems very quickly and, and make it as simple as possible. And then as Arun mentioned, you know, this open ecosystem and partnerships with the open source community are, are super important. So we continue to build relationships um, with these communities, with these individual developers, just to help them design products, tools, code samples, all kinds of things that make their lives easier. And uh, we do this through all the ones that, that were mentioned previously, plus things like IPDK, OpenVINO, VRAN, popular AI frameworks. I think Arun mentioned TensorFlow. So lots of contributions. 
Um, and ultimately, it comes down to this developer first approach that, that we all talk about so much. Mm-hmm. It's thinking about this mindset of, OK, developers, how do they think? What do they have to go through? How can we improve the offerings and experience that, that they're going to have you know, by working with us? And ultimately, it's about helping developers make their dreams come true. And to do that, we just have to make things as easy as possible for them, simplifying development, delivering this world-class developer experience wherever they're choosing to develop. I love what you say about Intel's trying to make it easier, trying to make it simpler, but there are still challenges. You know, that was the yes. entire point of past day one keynote is that there are top challenges for developers that we are trying to help them overcome and trying to solve. Can you talk a little bit more about the top challenges you see developers facing and maybe some of your recommendations for overcoming them? Of course. Yeah, as we as we look at, you know, some of the things that are happening in the industry with cloud native development, this idea of distributed computing where we can have compute where and when we, we need it, AI being a pervasive workload across all industries and, and applications, and then people moving away from fixed function devices to more software defined networks, software defined, you know, edge. Um, we see these transitions and they create challenges and they create opportunities, of course. I think, you know, if you look at the these kind of one at a time with with AI being so pervasive, you know, the opportunity is for everyone to participate in AI, but we realize it's a little challenging, it's complex. So developing these AI models, uh, getting them to deployment can be complex. So what we've worked on is how do we help developers, you know, simplify the, the access to technology? Again, I'll come back to this broken record of the Intel Gaming <laughs> platform, but being able to you know, have a tool like that and make that available for developers where they can create models by labeling, training, optimizing, and then retraining, just drag and drop simple for them. Uh, that helps make AI much more accessible. And, and of course, we've talked about Open OpenVINO, uh, a, a great way to take those models that are developed and ultimately de- deploy those. And again, working on making that accessible for all developers. One of the other you know, things that is challenging is, you know, I've heard from developers who are saying, hey, look, I, I understand that I can use the Intel Getty platform. I understand I can use OpenVINO and, and that's great. But then how do I get this deployed? What's the right hardware for me? And, you know, I don't know, do I need a, a Xeon? Can I do it on a core? Do I need a GPU or other accelerator? What, what is the, the process? And, and one of the use cases that they can easily solve with our developer cloud for the edge is coming in and very, very quickly being able to take their applications and know what the actual performance is going to be on real hardware. And they can test it on a whole variety of hardware in a very short amount of time. In fact, they can take all of those reference implementations that I was talking about uh, in the developer catalog, run those as well and understand how they perform. Um, the last you know, thing here is just looking at this idea of how to innovate around open platforms. I think you know, for developers, often the, the, the challenge can be, you know, hey, with all of this um, new technology, this changing space, the rate of change that's happening, um, how do I participate in that? And you know, for us, by offering choice and interoperability, by having that open platform, by engaging developers in those communities, uh, by contributing to the open source, we're doing all of this to make the developers successful, to make it easier for them to deal with the challenges uh, that they're seeing on a a day-to-day basis, to try and be a presence that's helpful for them. I love that water and fish analogy, (laughs) Um, to make that water better, to make that experience better. And again, all of this, so developers spend their time where it matters most for them. It's inventing, creating, solving their problems and their challenges. Let's talk about that water here in our last minute or so. I think one of my favorite quotes and approaches to business is Peter Drucker that culture eats strategy for breakfast. Some people say lunch. I don't really know. Breakfast or lunch. But culture is king. And you're a champion of this internal culture at Intel. How is that culture supporting developers? Ah, yes. This is a great question. So, you know, one of my favorite aspects of the Intel culture is fearless innovation. This idea of really pushing the boundaries, failing fast, and continuing to push. So we can innovate, but you've got to do it fearlessly. And, you know, when we do that with our, another value, customer obsession, we do this in service of our customers and the developers at those customers and partners. Together, these things help us, help the industry. Um, it pushes me, it pushes our teams. We, we look at, okay, 
what is the problem that developers are facing? If we're trying to simplify the development process, create a seamless experience, build an open ecosystem, offer this choice and interoperability, like all these are, are great. But when we look at how do we help today? How do we help tomorrow? It's about putting yourself in the shoes, the life of that engineer that's outside trying to solve that problem, taking that developer first perspective and saying, what is it that we need to do? What is it we can do to provide a, a, a better experience, to provide a new tool, to break down a barrier, you know, to help with that open innovation? And so this culture pushes me and I think pushes a lot of us inside of Intel to be able to continue to innovate on behalf of our customers and, and their developers. Uh, and again, just you know, help them create a little bit more of that magic that they do so well. I love that, bringing it full circle on the magic and the magic of that developer first lens that goes into the whole culture here at Intel. Thank you, Bill. Let's move on to Jen. Jen, bring it home for us. We heard a lot at innovation on AI with Intel Xeon processors with built-in AI accelerators that provide that performance edge. But another area top of mind today across the board is sustainability. Can built-in AI accelerators help with sustainability? And what should developers do to harness the capabilities in Xeon processors while also being environmentally friendly? Yeah, thank you. It's a great question. Um, really excited about both the AI accelerators and other ones uh, that we discussed at um, this week as well. So when you utilize these built-in accelerators, you're essentially getting more performance from the same hardware. And that's just a really smart thing to do. When you do that, you're going to be using less power overall mm -hmm. because you're basically maximizing uh, the transistors that are there, the use of the hardware that is already there. And if you're doing AI in the cloud or on-prem using TensorFlow, you take a few short, short steps and enable a deep learning boost for TensorFlow. Um, you know, there's a publication that we had through Serve the Home, and they tested this on Amazon's EC2 M6i instance. And they alone saw a 4x boost in performance per watt right there. So wow. developers should really, right, it's about significant. It's <laughs> impressive. Yeah, it is. That's significant. Yeah, but, but that's, you know, back to what Bill was saying we're really looking ahead to what are, the, what are the workload needs? What are the workload challenges? What are the bottlenecks that are getting in the way? And that is why we've innovated you know, over decades <laughs> to put these accelerators into the products. Um, and it's really in service to ac accelerating the workload, removing, you know, enabling it to run at lower power. And this is just a great example. Um, so developers should really aspire to utilize everything that is built into the hardware and the capabilities that are in the Xeon processors if they truly want to compute sustainably. Um, and we've, we've got many other uh, areas that, you know, I'll, I'll just give a little example. So some of the AI accelerators that were uh, unveiled with our fourth gen Xeon uh, upcoming, that Intel Advanced Matrix extension. Um, and it's great for usages and workloads like recommendation systems, um, you know, image recognition and more. Um, there are many other uh, accelerators that were also discussed this week. Uh, Bill mentioned a couple of them as well. Uh, we highlighted uh, quick assist technology, um, can be used for compression, open SSL, IPsec. Like once you really start harnessing the full power of the capabilities inside the hardware, you're now utilizing less energy. You're not, you know, moving using utilizing the network uh, and moving it to a discrete accelerator and back. Right? You you have a lot of power and capability right inside the product. Um, so developers should just really focus um, on that, uh, so that you can save the valuable, you know, high performance cores to do, you know, the, the majority of the work that you need to get done, um, and that that will save power and ensure that your code is more efficient. Well, I want to highlight a point that you made in, in that answer too, that this isn't new for Intel, that Intel's been keeping sustainability top of mind for decades, similar to what Arun said earlier about Intel. This is not new for Intel. <laughs> this commitment to open source, this commitment to sustainability, this, this commitment to developer first in the culture, this is who Intel's been for a very long time. Yeah, that's right. right. Wait. Let's yeah, decades of, of not only innovation in the hardware, but in our environmental footprint in our factories as well, which is really unique. 
across, mm-hmm. you know, semiconductor companies, right? We're, we alone are, are building our products and our processors with 80% renewable electricity. That lowers the mm-hmm. embodied carbon of an Intel product well beyond uh, any other, you know, processor, data center class processor that's out there. And so when you're choosing Intel, you're actually choosing a lower car- embodied carbon product. Uh, in addition to the, the innovation and the acceleration of the workload. Yeah, just another thing to be proud of when you choose Intel. Yeah. So most people think of performance per watt as a hardware issue. How can software optimizations and continuous improvement with the help of this developer community help impact that power consumption and performance? Yeah, so we, we also had a really interesting talk by two of our AI software solution engineers on the importance of optimizing machine learning deployments using the one API, AI analytics toolkit, optimizing a single instance in the cloud can improve the response time by 3x, but it can also emit three times less carbon. So you project that out over a year, this is the carbon equivalent of an acre of forest land. And that's not even counting the 4x improvement from the hardware acceleration that we talked about, uh, you know, earlier. You multiply that times the thousands of instances. And if developers made this an integral part of the work, the impact that that could have on the planet. Um, So we, you know, developers will be evolving. We're at the beginning of a journey of really starting to think about software in this way. Um, You know, Arun talked about open ecosystems. We are a part of the Green Software Foundation, really trying to seek to drive, to educate, to build standards, um, to help developers really start to think differently about architecting uh, your solution. And so when you do, and if you're at a corporation, once you understand the carbon savings that you're able to achieve, you can also share it with your, you know, sustainability office at your company, because we know, you know, enterprises, boards, you know, and regulators are starting to look for the savings uh, that everyone is achieving through their actions. That's right. I think ESG is becoming just as important to analysts and to business evaluators and to boards as your performance and your revenues, right? That's right. So I have one more question for you. Saving power is on everyone's mind from the data center to the boardroom, like we just talked about. How can developers help drive efficiencies as they create innovative solutions? Yeah, it's, it's great. Um, Great question. We really, I think, want to step back and think about how did we get here? And I think, you know, there's there's two major things that have happened in the last two decades that have, you know, increased the the attention on this power consumption and saving power. And one was um, the as uh, compute resources were unconstrained, we pivoted to programming languages that were less efficient because there was sufficient compute resources. And then we moved to cloud. And a little known fact that you might not know is networks actually consume one and a half times the energy as data centers. And so, right? Mm -hmm. Shocking. (laughs) Yeah, it is. And as developers, you know, you start to think about, well, you know, what role is the network playing in how I'm designing you know, this, this application. So we, we know the constraints that are faced on you, um, performance, productivity, portability, quality, code, um, maximizing your own productivity, but we really are looking forward to, you know, this next era to encourage you to add the energy efficiency and that focus on green software um, to your future designs and optimizing it within the designs you have today. Thinking about consuming the least amount of electricity possible with your application. You can utilize, Intel also has power controls and power states um, that, you know, can lower the overall solution um, when it's not in use. Um, Hardware efficiency, we talked about that. How do you use those accelerators? So you're utilizing the least amount of embodied carbon possible and then being carbon aware so that you're, you know, performing your application when electricity is clean and using less when it's dirty. And then, as I mentioned on that network, I'll just end there, you know, think about the network efficiency. You know, how are you utilizing, you know, as little as possible, because that is also a major power consumer. So there is a huge amount. We actually believe the biggest lever for uh, data center power savings. 
and you know, globally, I guess, ICT power savings, it's in the developer's hands. So we look forward to partnering with you on this journey as we you know, are, are convening in the Green Software Foundation and driving standards, education, and, and moving forward. So thank you. That's awesome. Thank you, Jen. Thanks for being here. I'd like to, if everyone's okay with staying just a few minutes over, I'd like to bring in a question from our audience. Will Intel have any plans on AR VR development? Anyone who wants to chime in on that? I, I think we, we do have plans. I don't think we have experts on this call to okay. be able to speak to it. Yeah, I, 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 would say, I, I would say usually, you know, any such plans are disclosed. I would say join us on Intel Vision or Intel Innovation next year. Um, so any such plans would be disclosed over there or uh, follow the Intel PR if anything comes out over there. Those are uh, usual standard channels where you will find out this kind of information. Awesome. Thanks, Arun. So everybody follow along on social media and we will see you at Vision in May for some really exciting announcements. Well, with that, I know we're out of time and all good things must come to an end. So we're going to wrap up today's episode of Processing Out Loud and a big week here at Intel Innovation. I'd like to thank Arun Gupta, Bill Pearson, and Jen Hofstetler for joining us today. This has been an awesome conversation. Thank you, all of you at home and around the world, for tuning in. For Intel, I'm Madeline Littrell-Coyle, and thank you for listening. <laughs>